All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Janice Litvin, who is literally just up the coast in Northern California in Walnut Creek in the Bay Area. How are you doing, Janice? Thank you. I'm doing very well. Delighted to be here, John. Absolutely. And Janice is the author of uh, Banish Burnout, a Banish Burnout Toolkit. Uh, and, uh, and this is great. And I think this is really timely, Janice, this your, your book, your Banish um, Burnout Toolkit. It, it, it's very timely because it seems to me in some ways that even pre-pandemic people were, I think there was a move towards people starting to kind of assess where they are in life a little bit more and their work and what their job means to. I think the, the pandemic really accentuated that. And now I think we're in a situation where a lot of people are, are trying to figure out why they feel like they do, why they feel so overwhelmed. And, and your point is like burnt out. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, People were already getting burned out to the tune of two thirds of American workers, according to numbers from 2018. And then earlier in 2021, that number was changed to 77%. Yeah. And we can understand that the pandemic caused a lot of uncertainty, a lot of confusion, lack or loss of control. And those are the areas that are key drivers of stress and burnout. So people are very, very frustrated. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, and I guess that's it. If you, if you, uh, you know, getting into your book, I mean, one of the things you start, the very thing you started is learn to stop and conduct your stress audit. And I just think that's an interesting right now. It's because people almost don't want to stop, right? They don't want to stop for a moment and do the awareness work. I don't know whether they're afraid of what it might turn up or maybe they're just so addicted to move to momentum, even if it's stressful. Well, it's interesting because what I've been thinking about kind of connected to what you're saying, what I've been thinking a lot about is burnout is not a one way street. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, when we thought about burnout, we thought about what we, the individual can do to improve our self care. But in reality, the organization quite often is the one creating the burnout environment and the workers are reacting. And so for example, let's say you have a company that's invested heavily into their wellness programs and they've got free gourmet food and a quiet room and yoga and Zumba and all kinds of wonderful superfluous. I mean, they're all important. I don't mean to say they're superfluous. What I mean to say is, the way you treat the employees is the best part of wellness. And it's not under the wellness hat, but it really should be. The way you treat people, do you show gratitude, which seems to be a hot topic all over social media today? I guess somebody wrote that it's National Gratitude Day, so everybody's blogging about gratitude. But really showing employees gratitude, showing that you appreciate them, listening to them, bringing them to the strategy table, not just making rules and then saying, well, I'm the CEO, whatever I say goes, you're not gonna keep people very long. And right now it's harder to find employees than it has been in many years. Yeah, no, that that is absolutely, that's absolutely for sure. And yeah, I, I think, uh, and, and interestingly, you touched upon the, all those kind of superfluous things, because I think there was a trend for a while where people thought like if they put in all these extraneous or superfluous goodies, um, then, hey, everybody should be really happy. But then, as you said, if you're overloading people and working them into the ground and, and they're feeling marginalized or whatever, it doesn't matter how many foosball tables, you can give them one each, it's not going to make a difference. Exactly. If you're abusing them and they feel <laughs> emotionally weak, they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, agree that uh, it has to come. You know, there's, there's, it's a two-way street, and and uh, you know, the organization has has a part to play. Um, but how do people start to recognize stressors in themselves or burnout in themselves? Because we're very good at noticing it in other people. Or pointing, we're great at pointing things out in other people all the time. But yes. we're not as great as looking backwards at ourselves. And we live in this weird society today where it's almost frowned upon to spend silent time with yourself. 
Well, it was for many years. I think once we, people like Simone Biles came out and said, I need to leave the Olympics right in the middle of the Olympics. We all woke up and said, oh, maybe we better be paying attention to mental health. So, and, but re in reality, we were, some of us were already thinking a lot about that before, and we were already advocating for including mental health in the world of wellness, that it wasn't just about physical fitness or mindful meditation. It's really about, like you said, recognizing in others and ourselves. So first of all, if you see something about someone else that you're close to, or if you're a manager and it's someone on your team, don't just sweep it under the carpet. You need to say something because sometimes some people are not aware of their own mental health state of being. And I'll give you a simplistic example, but I think this illustrates the point. So I consider myself generally happier. I used to not be. I went through a huge transformation, which was the genesis of my program and my book. Mm -hmm. But um, now in general, I consider myself pretty aware. I connect with myself either through writing or meditation every day. I talk to my family. How's it going? How are you all doing? Because my husband, my son, and I all live here and we're all entrepreneurs. So we're all helping each other all the time. But around month three into the pandemic, when we all thought, oh, this will be okay. It was mid-March, April, May, June. By, by middle of June, it's all going to be over. And then we come to find out, no, now we're looking at September. And one day I snapped at my husband in the kitchen. And I don't usually behave like that. I used to a lot, but not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, that was kind of rude. <laughs> and so I went into another room and I sat down with my pen and paper and I realized how much the pandemic was really getting to me, that I was very desperate to see a real human friend and not just on Zoom, although Zoom helped. Mm -hmm. I needed to see my friends. I needed to get out more human to human. And I said to my husband, well, first I apologized. And then I said to him, this weekend, let's go drive. We have these good friends. Let's drive to their house. We can sit in our car and they can be six feet apart, but we need to go see our friends. And they ended up throwing a big blanket out on the lawn. And we all sat on the lawn and had a picnic and chatted. And, you know, sometimes we forget how critically important our friends are, but really it's a huge part of our self-care. So sometimes it's these little behavioral outbursts little angry outbursts that we recognize in ourselves and other people around us that were like, hey, maybe I'm approaching a little bit of burnout. Maybe I need to look at myself a little more closely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that there's always the clues there. And just going back to something else for a moment that you mentioned there about um, hopefully we're moving into a time where mind body is uh, the mind body connection is understood in a better way because you're 100 percent right it's great having physical fitness uh, and healthy you know initiatives at work and all of that kind of stuff but if you're not connecting the mind to it you know it's only half of the equation anyway and your mind is going to impact your body if it's not looked after properly as well, just as vice versa. But I, I'm glad that people are starting to wake up to that mind-body connection. Yes, oh yeah. The mind impacts the body and the body impacts the mind. Mm -hmm. It's just like with sleep, sleep impacts stress and stress impacts sleep. We, we've known, we've heard for many years, well, we should get between seven and eight hours of sleep, but until we live it and as we age, until we really pay attention to our sleep, and learn to develop better sleep hygiene, do we realize when we wake up without the correct amount of sleep, we're gonna be really, really cranky that day, which impacts others and ourselves. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of that comes under the under the umbrella of, of what you call is like is self care. It's um, making sure all you're looking at yourself and all aspects of your of your life. And and the thing is, again, I mean, in some ways, you know, we've conditioned ourselves that oh, we don't take care of ourselves. We take care of other people. Right. And mm -hmm. and we 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 don't realize the fact is, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. Right. That's what RuPaul says. RuPaul says, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love anybody else? Mm -hmm. And it's really, really true. If you are not resilient in yourself, then you cannot help other people. And the resilience 
meaning developed by the self-care, the sleeping, the eating, the getting enough sunshine and the mental self-care, all of those add up to becoming, being and maintaining resilience. And if we're not resilient, then we are going, it's kind of like not filling up your car with enough gasoline, you're gonna run out. And there are little signs along the way, but sometimes we get so wound up in our busyness of our business that we forget to pay attention. Yeah, and, and to your point, I mean, I think about the the pandemic, uh, you know, it's really tested uh, the levels of people's resilience, but hopefully it has illuminated or shone a light on areas that, you know, people need to pay pay more attention to. And, you know, the idea of, of being more transparent, being more communicative, um, understanding how you operate, how, how the company operates, how other people operate around you. I mean, I think this is all, these are all like huge, benefits if we're looking for silver linings i think there's some silver linings coming out of it because these things have come into focus in a way they haven't before yes and it, what what i'm thinking about in listening to you is the importance of emotional intelligence mm -hmm. you know a lot of ceos and c suite and other level other leaders at that higher level are not as emotionally intelligent as one would hope or as they might think. And it depends on how they grew up. You know, I grew up in a home where therapy, you know, my parents are from an older generation, but they grew up thinking therapy meant you were crazy. And oh my gosh, nobody got therapy. And so, and I realize now that's changing, but a lot of company leaders think, well, I've got to be strong and I can't show any emotion. But in reality, when you begin to show your vulnerability, you give everybody else in the company freedom to show their vulnerability. And all that vulnerability really does make us stronger because then we all know each other better and we can help build each other up. Yeah, it's funny you say that because uh, I'm, you know, I'm from Ireland, born and grew up in Ireland. And we just always used to think that uh, all Americans were in therapy. Um. <laughs> well, therapy got very popular. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 1970s and 80s but i know i'm just saying because on popular culture you know it was mentioned so much we were just like wow everybody in america must be in therapy that's amazing well the, pretty much a lot of people were but not everybody it just depends on how you grew up <laughs> yeah no no for sure for sure it, it does and i think and i think that's part of the what's coming out of this more it's like as you said, it's, it's, you know, people being a little bit more transparent and especially leaders like opening up a little bit more and involving people. And, and I think sometimes when you say things like that, you know, some people fear, well, you know, well, how far do we go? You know, I don't want to end up in an organization where, you know, it's all, all focused on, you know, touchy feely goodness or where, you know, but we're not actually getting anything done. So there's, there's a, I think sometimes there's a, re there's a reluctance there because people think it'll go too far. Well, you can get pretty touchy feely and still get your job done. You don't have to be mm -hmm. touching and feeling all day. And I'm being very, <laughs> very facetious. I hope <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. this, that I'm, yeah, I'm, that of course, touching is inappropriate in the workplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about we're talking about it in the emotional, uh, in emotional emotional metaphorically yeah. but yes yeah. we can get our work done and support each other in that touchy feely way but still get a, a lot of work done we can work we you know a lot americans are hard workers in general we put mm -hmm. our heads down and we work really hard and if after the end of a project if no one says to you wow great job. You worked really hard. I appreciate how hard you worked. And I, I'm sure the results are going to show that. And um, we as a company know that your work is important and we value it and we value your opinion, then I'm going to feel good about my employer and I'm going to want to stay there. But if no one ever says good job, then that's not going to be good. And many years ago, I won't say the name of the company, but it was a large clothing manufacturer in San Francisco and everyone in the San Francisco area. <laughs> I'm talking about. Yeah, and yeah. I, I was in software QA and my boss was an internal IT auditor that okay. came to the software QA team. And so she was very numbers driven. And so she never, ever, ever said, good job. You're working so hard. None of that at review time. You know, she would, 
have the standard for those of you who remember. I'm not sure how reviews are done now, but mm -hmm. first of all, we never reviewed our managers. They reviewed us. And there might be one little sentence about, you know, you have a good attitude and then this yep. long criticism. And I mm -hmm. said, she said, do you have any questions? I said, you know, you never compliment my work. You never give me positive reinforcement. And here's an interesting commentary. She said to me, well, you're so strong willed. I didn't think you needed it. Um, and she forgot. She yes, she forgot that strong willed people are still human beings and we still need we're still emotional beings and we still need that support. Yeah, no, I think that's a great. I think that's a great example there, and and I do. I I always joke about that. The the, the reviews. It's like where you struggle. They struggle to come up with one thing you did well, and then fifty five yes. million things you have to improve upon. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I think yeah, but we we're we're very we're very good, and we're very quick to catch people doing things incorrectly. We're very poor at catching people doing things correctly and commenting on it very poor very very poor it, that would be one of my biggest goals is to make managers aware that we have to we have to compliment people and you can start with little things mm -hmm. you know thanks for making the coffee or thanks for mm -hmm. you know thanks for organizing that team softball game or whatever it is you know start small but keep complimenting people and keep keep engaging people and keep getting yeah. them engaged. And I know it's very, very difficult because some people have come back to work, other people are not coming back to work and it's very mishmashy and it's very confusing right now, but you can still create, create a cohesive dynamic, even on Zoom. You can still play games sure, on Zoom. Sure. You can put on music and everybody get up and dance. You can tell jokes, you can get everyone laughing, which is a really good um, positive mindset kind of way to start a meeting or start with gratitude or start with your gratitude towards your team at the beginning of yeah. every meeting. Yeah, but I'd be just on what you touched on there. I mean, gratitude and politeness. I mean, I think these are things that are, I mean, they're so simple, they're free, they're easy, they don't take a lot of time, but they have an outsized impact. And I think, and that's, and I think also, you know, we've lived in a world that's become, we perceive to be extremely fast paced. So I I would argue that it's just distractions. There's a lot more distractions, and it's also gone very casual. So we're it's people have become very comfortable with uh, with leaving out the simple things like gratitude, like politeness, like acknowledgement. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I was speaking in a presentation earlier this morning, and that that came up in a big way about um, let's start with some little things, some little areas of ways to support each other, so that. Um, employees have the freedom to come to a manager and say, I'm beginning to feel overworked. I'm beginning to feel overwhelmed. I already work nine hours a day and then I have to manage my child's homework and cook dinner and you know my partner's doing all they can, but we need to look at my situation. Either we need to rearrange my deadlines or offload some projects or change the scheduling, but um, People need the freedom to push back with their mm -hmm. calendaring and all their commitments, because otherwise they're they're in a little um, cave just doing their work and they don't know how they're being perceived. Yeah, and I think important about that point uh, as well is um, is Janice that. Uh, we often as managers, I mean, I love it when somebody comes to me with says like, I'm overwhelmed right now, I've got too much so that we can sit down and prioritize. And the thing that nearly always happens in those situations is you realize maybe they're doing a couple of things that actually aren't that higher priority, or maybe you've even forgotten they were doing or whatever. And so it actually works out uh, to the benefit of, of both people, I think. Uh, and that's why I think it's, it's, a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great thing for people to encourage to say, listen, if you are overwhelmed or you're not clear or you're whatever, you just come and sit down, we'll figure it out. But actually what, what you're saying without even realizing what you're saying, the way I perceive it is, it's the manager's responsibility to know what's going on. Now, I know not every manager is as organized and good as at project management as they should be, but they can at least check in with every single individual on their team every week, at least once a week. What are you working on? What are your commitments? How's it going? What help do you need from me? And that yeah. opens the door to, well, I've got these five piles on my desk. And then 
so-and-so from another department dumped something on me that said it was our responsibility. And so I just said, yes. And really, yeah. really, I need you to push back for me or whatever, whatever it is, yep. they may not be aware of everything that's going on for you. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, the critical point is they, they may not be aware. And yes, you're correct. And you may have landed with uh, everybody is giving you something. You've got five different things and they've all been you've been told that they're all a priority. And, right. and that's and that's right. where people really start to go. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's that is the role of the manager is to make, make sure and check in and make sure what is going on. What are you working on? Right. So I coach this one young woman who is a chemical researcher, research scientist with a degree in chemistry. And this is her first job out of college. So she thinks she's supposed to say yes to everybody. Mm -hmm. So she's working on creating these uh, experiments. And in a lab right now, you can imagine how important all the work is. So there is a manager that she never sees. So there's all these senior lab people running around in white coats. And it's very clear there's a hierarchy, who's senior and who's junior. <laughs> so she's working on someone's deadline and there's like 150 plates she's got to prepare for this lab uh, experiment that's due, you know, in the in a minute because the next day somebody's got to make a presentation to management. Another senior lab person comes in and says, um, how many plates do I have for my experiment tomorrow? And she's like, well, you know, I've got this deadline today. Um, you know, I, I don't have time to yeah. go over there. And the, and the person comes in and says, well, why don't you just go get up and go look? I mean, it's really demeaning the way this is happening. This is playing out. And she finally turned to her and said, well, you can go, <laughs> you can go count the plates. And the woman almost had a, an, a, a breakdown because somebody pushed back to her. I mean, yeah. that's not the right culture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I do, absolutely, and and it's um and may and hopefully in that situation maybe that person then can go away and reflect uh, on on why it surprised her that somebody pushed back and what was the reason they pushed back and then hopefully in those instances maybe you incrementally get a better workplace. We 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 can only hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, Janice, this has been great. The book is The Banished Burnout Toolkit. Uh, Janice Litvin, there'll be a link to the book below this video and a link to Janice. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. OK, so I help leaders and teams banish burnout in the or in their organizations through keynote speeches, workshops and mastermind groups in the form of the Banish Burnout Book Club. Those are free. And um, <clears throat> I, I love doing workshops. I, they can either be an hour, 90 minutes. I have one client that asks me to do six hours. So I'm very excited because we're gonna get into a deep dive. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of improv games as part of the learning with a lot of fun stories where we're all telling stories. So it's a lot of fun. It's very experiential. And um, feel free to reach out to me and just ask me how you can work with me. Yeah, fantastic. So I'd encourage people to check out the links below. Check out Janice, check out the Banished Burnout Toolkit. Goodness knows uh, we need to give ourselves all of the opportunities we can to be successful and to positively impact those around us. So, hey, burnout's natural. It happens to us all. So it's just a good time now to maybe do that self-awareness work. Anyway, thank you again, Janice. Uh, thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it.